Please open your Bibles to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1. Greatly appreciate Nick's reading of James chapter 1. As I compared the two passages, I was surprised at the similarities between not just the first chapter, but the whole book. James and Peter would have known one another, and I'm sure they talked at different times about what God was doing in their hearts and lives, and the Holy Spirit was pleased to prompt both of them to write significant uh, doctrine about trials. Well, we're in 1 Peter, and you may recall that last week, or if you weren't here, last week we dealt with an incomparable salvation out of 1 Peter. Kind of a, a hook, if you will, to hang our anchor on as we swing down into trials. That's what Peter does. He spends the first several verses of his book saying, you have an incredible salvation. You are chosen. You are born again to a living hope. You are heirs with Christ. And this inheritance that you're going to get is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, unimaginable, really. Nothing on this earth is that way save God's word, but an unperishable, imperishable, undefiled inheritance. That's where he starts us out. That's all future. That's all eternal. And he gives us that perspective before he pulls us back to what we might call reality. That's reality too, but we don't see it. We don't live it. And so now we come this week. I'd like to read uh, verses 6 through 12. Please follow along as I read this. In this, that is, in the salvation we've just written about, and the fact that you are heirs of it, you greatly rejoice, even though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. As to the salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or what time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Amen. Well, last week, an incomparable salvation. Today, we're going to look at a proven faith. This is, in our perspective, this is, this is now. This is now, and this is temporary, as opposed to the contrast of last week with future and eternal. This is right now. So a proven faith. I want to talk, first of all, this morning about the character of trials, the nature of trials, what are they like? What are they made up of? How, what can we expect? We're not talking about the universal human suffering that comes from the fall of the creation. That's across the entire earth and every person is part of it. I'm not talking about those things. Peter's not talking about them. Rather, Peter speaks of trials with a specific and revealing purpose. He says in chapter 4, verse 12, he says, These trials that we're talking about, they are for your testing. So, that's what Peter talks about in verse 6. He says, we're going to work our way backwards in the verse a little bit. He says, you have been distressed by various trials or tests. The character of trials is that they are tests. James used the same word that Nick read to us. Consider it all joy, my brother, when you encounter various trials tests or trials, knowing that that testing of your faith produces endurance. 
If I had to summarize it, I would say that trials are the testing or trying of a person's character, fidelity or faithfulness, and his claim to faith. Can I say that again? This is important. Trials are the testing or trying of a person's character, fidelity, and my claim to faith. It's a putting to proof. Trials essentially say to us, prove it. Prove it. So trials are first uh, tests. Secondly, they touch all of life. This one, we could probably talk the rest of the morning. Peter says there are various trials. Like James 1, 2, he says various trials, various testings. You could name them as well as I, health and physical. We could just stop right there, couldn't we? Health and physical trials, how many of us have had those? Especially after a pandemic has gone through and exacerbated problems that you may have already had. It's a universal problem that there are trials. There's work and vocational trials. And sometimes there are material and financial trials that kind of grow out of that. Maybe you can't work. Maybe you do work and something goes wrong at work and you no longer have a job. There are family and relational trials. That's probably the hardest one for me. Family and relational trials because it's something you may not be able to solve. You may not be able to work it out because you're only half the equation in a two-party conflict. There are mental and emotional trials that come out of the angst from all these things. It's almost like a crescendo as you look at the different ways that we are tested. These are so real and so tangible. I really don't need to talk about it, except if we sat down and I just listened to you, would you be able to tell me of the trials in your life? Everyone has trials of some sort. Over the past seven days, I couldn't believe this. I, this isn't normal. Over the past seven days, I had two friends approach me that are at fear of losing their jobs. Two this week. Another example from this week, one of my closest friends is facing what really amounts to a mental, physical, and really uh, moral health crisis in their wayward daughter. These aren't people you would know. I learned this week of something that happened back in April that was heart-wrenching in the sand hills of Nebraska. A 32-year-old mother with two small children, friend of our oldest, ch oldest children, our adult children, was killed in a four-wheeler accident in the sand hills. She had her, one of her children with her in a car seat, and he survived and she did not. That's just this week of things I became aware of. You could add to the list, couldn't you? If we expanded the time frame to the last couple of months or the last six months or the last year or the last five years, we would be overwhelmed with a recounting of the trials that people go through. This is also very real to us. Yet Peter gives a necessary caution here about trials. He's careful to clarify what he means by it and the suffering that they inflict. So he's going to kind of put a qualifier here that's very important. He says in 1 Peter 4.15, make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a troublesome meddler. Now, I, I'm kind of going check as I read that list. I don't, well, I haven't murdered anybody in the sense that we normally think of it. I haven't stolen anything. I'm not evildoer, at least not routinely, I hope, but a troublesome meddler. You get in to stir up the pot between some others that are having conflict. You get involved in business not your own. That's what Peter says. He doesn't want us suffering as those things. And in 1 Peter 2.20, he says, What credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? That's not the kind of trial he's talking about. So we can't just say, well, everything, I'm just going through suffering. So much of our suffering is because of our own stupidity, our own stubbornness, our own selfish focus. That's true in my life. 
And if we all take a look in the mirror, we'll find that we cause a lot of our own suffering. That's not what Peter's talking about. Instead, Peter is talking about the trials and suffering in any and every area of life, we named several, which test my faith in God, his provision, or his salvation. You can find this in the text all the way through chapter 1. When I am tempted to question God's provision or his salvation or God himself, why have you? These are the trials and suffering that Peter is talking about. So he gives three examples. These are later in the book, which we won't have a chance to actually go to, but I want to read them to you. 1 Peter 3.14. Even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. Do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. So the first zeroing down, narrowing down of the types of trials Peter's talking about is found there. It's suffering because of right living, right thinking, right actions in God's eyes. Where do you think Peter got that? Do you remember the Sermon on the Mount? Jesus said, Matthew 5, verse 10, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is the type of suffering that Jesus taught Peter and Peter teaches us. When you do right things and you suffer for it, this is the trial that's in view. He gives another example. 1 Peter 4.16 If anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. I like that. What name did he just give there? What name did he just give in the text? It's the name of Messiah, the Anointed One, the Christ. It's Jesus Christ. If you suffer because of your association with Christ, this is what Peter has in mind. John 15, we don't turn there, but I recall in previous study in that passage where Jesus said, well, they hate me, so they're going to hate you. They are persecuting me, so they are going to persecute you. That's association. That's association when you take the name of Christ, and Peter's not ashamed of it. He says if anyone suffers as a Christ one, a Christian, and you can go back to the book, book of Acts and see how that term was starting to be applied to those who followed Jesus, Christ ones, ones that followed Christ. So that's a second narrowing down. Righteousness, association with Christ. There's a third one. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9 says, Be of sober spirit, be on the alert, because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by our brethren. Satan and his minions easily and willingly attack the ones who follow Christ. Suffering that arises from spiritual opposition or attack certainly qualifies as the trials of which Peter speaks. And you know what Satan's go-to strategy is, don't you? What's his go-to? You can pick it out. What's his go-to strategy? You'll find it in Genesis 3. It's doubt. It's doubt. Has God said? We hear that from one another sometimes. Did, does it really teach that? Has God said if we can inject just a little bit of doubt, not the whole thing, but just a little bit of doubt about what God said, we're playing into Satan's major, I would say, strategy to create doubt. Well, the character of trials, they touch all of life. But it doesn't end there. Verse 6 says, distressed. I like the ESV better here. It's grieved grieved because of trials. Trials are painful. Duh. <laughs> They're painful. 
It means to cause sorrow or grief. I can't say that grief belongs uniquely to humans. In fact, the Bible uses the same word for the Holy Spirit of God in Ephesians 4.30. It says, let's don't grieve him. Let's don't cause the Holy Spirit distress by going against what we know to be his revealed will. But it's an exceptionally common one for people, isn't it? It's common for people. Just one quick example. Jesus said to the disciples as they were going to the Garden of Gethsemane, they're going deeper in. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament and the world will rejoice, but you will grieve. You will grieve. Later that same evening, we find out that the Son of God also grieved. In Matthew 26, toward the end of the chapter, it says, He, Jesus, took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be grieved or distressed. To go through trials is painful. It's painful. This is not news. But this is why we don't want to, we don't want to talk about it. This is why we want to avoid it at all costs. Is because it hurts. Sometimes trials can be exceptionally painful. Have you had one of those in your life? A trial that doesn't seem like anybody else identifies with and nobody else that you know of has had that experience? We need to be careful with that. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10.13, we don't normally think of it in this light, but it's the same word. He says that the temptations that we experience, the trials that we experience are common to man. And God will make a way of escape. But exceptionally raw and painful trials? 1 Peter 4.12, I didn't read it earlier, but I'll read the whole thing now. It says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you. That's quite a phrase, that fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. I think exceptionally painful trials are a lot more common than we think. At this church, we don't want you to walk alone through exceptionally painful trials. We want to show care and love and brotherhood when someone's going through an exceptionally difficult trial. Does history tell us anything about what Peter may have been indicating by this phrase, fiery ordeal? Well, I mentioned or just alluded to it last week, the Roman Emperor Nero. I did a little research just from the common history that's available from the Roman historian Tacitus. Tacitus didn't like the guy, to put it mildly. And so some people cast suspicion on his record, but he wrote about the Roman Emperor Nero. The guy was born like three or four years after Jesus ascended back to heaven. And he became emperor, guess when? At the ripe old age of 17. How many of you with teens want your 17-year-old ruling the world like that? It's kind of a scary thought, isn't it? He was a 17-year-old. The great fire of Rome, which burned up three-quarters of the city, happened when he was about 27. Yeah, that's what I say too. Wow. To be a 17-year-old and having dictatorial control of an empire like that? And then to have a fire like this? Well, Tacitus continues to tell us. It says, Christians were essentially scapegoated by Nero for the fire and heinously and mercilessly persecuted by him in, among other things, using them as living torches in his nighttime garden scenes. It didn't get better. Peter wrote this epistle in about the mid-60s, as near as we can tell. And that's when the fire happened. Four years later, he was assassinated. And civil war broke out in the Roman Empire. If you know anything about the Roman history, they had a mess. They had a republic, and then it's like they turned into dictatorship, and then it's like family infighting and incest and all kinds of things going back and forth. And now the dictator's assassinated. And Peter writes in this context, this broad context, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal, this painful ordeal you're going through. 
He says it will have a good effect, but we have to wait for that. We're not there yet in the text. So we talk about the character of trials. Let me try a more contemporary example. I don't know if I know this story well enough to not use my notes, but there's a lady whose testimony I only recently became aware of, uh, Dr. Helen Rosevere. She was a, an Irish lady, lived in Northern Ireland, part of the UK, and she became a missionary as God saved her. She had a heart for telling people about Christ, and she went to the Belgian Congo in the 1950s. She was there for a number of years, built a hospital, was working in medical work, and as happened with many African countries in the 60s, they were given their independence almost on a whim, just like, okay, well, we're going to pull out now. It's no longer uh, in vogue to be a colonial power, so you can have your independence. And there were so many warring tribes that civil war broke out in the Congo. And she tells a story, and I've only seen these tapes. She's with the Lord now, but I've only seen these testimonies in about 10 or 15-minute segments, and there's several of them. She tells of how the, the pain and the carnage began to get closer and closer to their hospital. And finally, it came to their doorstep, and she saw just atrocious things happening to her coworkers and to her friends and people she had treated. And indeed, it came to her own doorstep one terrible night when she was raped two times and had her teeth kicked in. And right during that time, during that time, she tells the story. She says, the Lord impressed me with the thought. Listen to this. Can you thank me for trusting you with these painful experiences, even if I never tell you why? It's a hard question. Why would that be happening? She had done nothing to the soldiers that committed these things against her. But she yielded herself to whatever God in his sovereignty had planned for her and tells of how she was flooded with inexplicable joy and peace in the midst of suffering. She has a book called Living Sacrifice. I actually haven't read it. I think it'd be well worth it. The title itself, Living Sacrifice. Peter says such fiery ordeals, which he says later in the book, should not surprise. Yet I find myself surprised. You get surprised at something like that that happens. It's like, where is God when that happened? We heard that a lot, those of us who were alive back in 2001, when the planes hit the towers in New York. Where is God? Where is God? Casting doubt on his sovereignty, his goodness, his care. I think this is why so many give up. This is why so many give up on Christ. It's just not worth it. I've walked down this road for decades and look where it got me. I know the stories are out there. If it hasn't happened to you, it's had, happened to someone close to you or someone you know of. There's exceptional and extreme and raw pain in your life because of the trials. It's like, something's wrong here. I missed the boat. It's in these times that faith has the opportunity to grow the strongest. In fact, faith grows the strongest, which is the point of the message. It's a proven faith. Faith grows the strongest when the tests are the stiffest. And the Bible tells us how. 1 Peter 2.20, you might flip over there. 1 Peter 2.20. I'm going to take just the last part of the verse. It says, if when you do what is right and suffer, there's the qualifier we talked about, you suffer for rightness, righteousness sake. You suffer for it. If you patiently endure, this finds favor with God. God is pleased by unjust suffering. Can you think of an example? I'll give you a clue. The book of Philippians, chapter 2. Was God pleased with any suffering that's recounted in that chapter? Yeah. He was really pleased that Jesus became obedient to the point of, oh, you're not going to suffer anymore. Now you're dead. So 
God raised him up and exalted him above the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to God's glory. Isn't that beautiful? Suffering. It needs to be remained under. That's what the word means. 1 Peter 2.20. You patiently endure. You stay under it. James echoes that. James 1.12. Blessed is the man who perseveres, who remains under trial. Once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Paul gets in the act. Romans 12.12. 12. He says, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation. That's remaining under the trial that God has allowed in your life. Staying there until his work is complete. Jesus himself, Matthew 10, 22, you will be hated by all because of my name. But it is the one who has remained under to the end, who has endured to the end, who will be saved. There is an amazing work with this incredible pain. We're still on pain. There's an amazing work that God can do. When the pain is the deepest, the faith can grow strongest. I don't understand it. But that's what Peter, by the Holy Spirit, is teaching us. Let's on, go on to a fourth characteristic of trials. I'm working my way backwards. We started with trials in, in the NASB trials, various, distress. Now we're going back to if necessary. I, I like that one. If necessary, man, I hope it's not necessary. Wouldn't you feel that way? But for the believer, trials have a purpose. They are according to need. And who's the one who's going to decide if they're necessary? God. Trials and tests are not the result of random chance or arbitrary circumstance. There are no accidents in your life. God has a purpose. He has a plan. He has a design. And I just can't see it. Which requires trust. Which is the whole point. He wants me to believe him. God is the loving sovereign determining when and how and to what degree trials are needed. Listen to Peter again, 1 Peter 4, 19. Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God. Yeah. We suffer according to his will, and we shall have a response. We shall entrust our souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. I love that. It gives us two little responses. Actually, they're not little at all. They're helpful responses to trials, to testing, to staying under a trial. It's really hard. I don't understand this. It's unjust. It says, remember. Remember that your creator is faithful. That is, he's worthy of trust. He's worthy of trust. Oh, I could go off on that. I could go off on that. He is so worthy of trust. What he says is true. It is factual. It is eternal and it will happen. Remember that your creator is faithful and entrust yourself completely to him and his sovereign purpose for the trials he allows in your life. Entrust yourself to him. You can't get out from under it. It's just this ever-present suffering. It seems like sometimes. For the believer, trials require trust. We're going to talk more about that with a graphic toward the end of the message, or right at the end of the message. For a believer, tri trials require trust. If you don't trust under trial, you're not a believer. That's a harsh statement, but I think the scriptures bear it out. We'll look at it more detail in just a moment. Complete trust is the treasured quality that trials perfect. Complete trust. Trust, like this lady whose story I told, Helen Roosevelt over in the Congo. Complete trust as a treasured quality the trials perfected in her life. Well, let's go on to the next one, the fifth one. They're temporary. They're temporary. 
Don't you love it? You work your way back in the verse. It says, for a little while. For a little while. No matter how it feels, trials will end. Through Peter, the Holy Spirit provides a gracious reminder that this is not forever. There is a terminus. It's going to end. 1 Peter 5.10 echoes this. He says, after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect and confirm and strengthen and establish you. Note the contrast in that verse. Suffered for a little while and eternal glory. He's taking us back up in that verse to kind of where we were last week. You have this anchor to hold on to that's eternal, it's future, it's certain, it's better than anything you can imagine. And we swing down into this life, into the trials that we face now. Well, we looked at the imperishable and unfading salvation. This is in bright contrast to what we experience now. But you know what? Paul says in Romans 8.18, I consider that the sufferings, listen, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy for comparison with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Think of your most painful trial or maybe the one you know of that is most painful to anyone around you. Scripture says it's not even worthy to be compared. And I'm, I'm kind of making a comparison as I think about it. We just talked about the salvation and we're comparing it to the trials. It's, they're not worthy for, a, worthy for a comparison. When you compare now versus future and a little while versus eternity, what is the comparison eventually? If we think about it logically, if we think about it spiritually really is a better way of saying that. Warren Wiersbe had an old statement. I had to look this up. Uh, Tom and I were talking about it on Wednesday. When God permits his children to go through the furnace, he keeps his eye on the clock and his hand on the thermostat. His loving heart knows how much and how long. Isn't that great? It's like he's got the smartphone app here and you can control your thermostat and the timing and all that and just boom. When has the work been accomplished in my life? Only God knows. Well, this is the character of trials according to Peter's words in verse 6. Let's move on to 7 through 9. The outcome of trials. What's the upshot of this? Where is all this taking us? I'll tell you up front, there's two options. Ultimately, only two options. The first one is beautiful. It's what Peter says. So that the proof of your faith, when you go through these types of trials, remembering suffering for the sake of righteousness, suffering for doing what is right, suffering because of spiritual attack, and those things hit all areas of life like we talked about earlier. There's some vestige of, of that hits everything in our lives. Well, the proven faith, we will come through the trials at some point. And God, with his loving and trustworthy design, will bring us through. Peter compares and contrasts in verse 7 the believer's proven faith with gold. He says, you've got pure gold, a precious commodity, and then you have proven faith, an immaterial gift worth more than gold more precious than gold. Then you have gold, which is stressed and purified by fire, and you have faith, which is stressed and proven by painful trials. Then you have gold as a useful store of temporal wealth, and you have proven faith, which is necessary for obtaining eternal salvation. Do you see it in the text? It says, verse 9, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Faith is necessary. Faith in Christ and God's work of redemption through his son is necessary for salvation. It's not that trials make us righteous. Trials prove the validity of the faith we say we have in the one who redeemed us by Christ's blood. Well, the last comparison Gold is perishable, and proven faith is imperishable. So which do you want? Which do you want? You can read the comparison right there. 
Peter's making the point that proven faith is far more valuable than gold, even though gold's been refined by fire. Your faith is being refined by something that's immaterial. In the case of the Christians of that time, it might have been by literal fire. Uh, this past week, somebody sent me, they, they found out, I, I guess I announced it last week, I was going to be preaching on trials out of 1 Peter. And this person said, oh, I love 1 Peter 1. It's one of my favorite chapters. Sent me some commentary. And it fits so well with this testimony for this Dr. Helen Rosevere, the medical missionary I told about, who's now with the Lord. I'd like to read this. Listen to this. God's purposes in present grief may not be fully known in a week, in a year, maybe even in a lifetime. Indeed, some of God's purposes will not even be known when believers die and go to be with the Lord. Some will only be discovered at the day of final judgment when the Lord reveals the secrets of all hearts and commends with special honor those who trusted in Him in hardship, even though they could not see the reason for it. They trusted Him simply because He was their God and they knew Him to be worthy of trust. It is in times when the reason for the hardship cannot be seen that trusting God alone seems to become the most pure and precious in His sight. Such faith He will not forget, but will store it up as a jewel of great value and beauty to be displayed and delighted in on the Day of Judgment. Genuine faith is more valuable to God than gold because he is a God who delights in being trusted. Do you believe that? For the one who comes to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who love him. God loves being trusted. This is, this is something I love to talk about. I love to evaluate my own life. Am I believing what God says? Am I believing what he actually says? So do I have a proven faith? If I do, what's the fruit? What grows out of a proven faith? Well, verses 8 and actually the end of 7 all the way through 8 and into 9 talk about the results or the fruit of a proven faith. First is love for Jesus Christ and continued belief in Him. I love Him. I love Him and I believe in Him. Do you see what it says in verse 8? Though you have... Not seeing him, you love him, though you do not see him now, but believe him. This is love and belief without sight. This is not blind faith. This is informed faith. This is true faith. This is proven faith that you know he is real because you see him working in your life. You can testify to the truth of his word when you trust him. I love that. Jesus said to Thomas, because you have seen me, have you believed? Happy are those who did not see and yet believed. You haven't seen Christ. You haven't seen him in the flesh. I haven't seen him in the flesh, but I believe in him. You believe in him. That is faith. You know what? That will be tested. That belief will be tested and maybe painfully tested as it has been in history and is in many places in the world right now, perhaps most places in the world. Well, it's not just love, apart from sight. It's joy. It's joy. How do we talk about this? Pure, unadulterated, unmatched joy. Here's one commentator. Peter conveys the concept with both an action word and a noun. You greatly rejoice with joy. And then he qualifies it with a couple of adjectives. Inexpressible, which actually describes a person who can't even express his joy in human terms. It's unbounded joy. I don't even know how to put it to words, is what you would say. That's the kind of joy. The other one is uh, the word that means an inability, but even an impossibility to convey the depth of of his joy. It's impossible. You can't really reduce it to words. It's something that's so internal. And, and I love this. Did you notice last week we ended with the first part of verse 6, in this you greatly rejoice. And we said, what are we rejoicing in? 
We greatly rejoice in the salvation that's laid up, un imperishable, undefiled, unfading, reserved in heaven for me as an heir with Christ. That's what I'm rejoicing in. And now it goes over the top because of trials. It says, in this you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Even though you have no sight, you have belief and love, and the joy just overflows. Well, there's a, another one. It's praise, glory, and honor at the revelation, the apocalypsis of Jesus Christ. When he comes again, it's similar to the doxologies of Revelation 4 and Revelation 5. You've read through those, and we make songs of those rightly. Myriads of myriads saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory. There's our words here. Honor and glory and praise. This is the fruit of a proven faith. Love, joy, praise, glory, honor. Some of it delayed for the revelation of Christ. In verse 9, the capstone, the salvation of your souls. Now take note, the salvation of your soul is an outcome not of trials, but of your proven faith. It's faith that pleases God. It's the look of faith that the thief on the cross gave to Christ, and Jesus said, you'll be with me. That's the first possibility, a proven faith. I want to be there, don't you? I want to be there. It probably means I have some heavy trials ahead. But there's a second possibility. This one's hard to talk about. Would you turn over to Luke 8, 11? I think some of this may be on the screen if you don't have your Bible. But Luke 8, 11, there's a second possibility for the outcome of trials. Trials can lead us to stay under it and to, because we trust what God has said, the suffering for right, righteousness sake will bring love and belief and overflowing joy and praise and honor and glory that comes out of my life. But the second possibility, just follow along as I read. It's Luke 8, 11. The parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Skip to verse 13. Those on the rocky soil, he's talking about people's hearts here, are those who when they hear receive the word with joy, and these have no root. They believe for a while, and in time of temptation, fall away. You want to guess what that word for temptation is? It's our word in 1 Peter. It's the testing of your faith. That's what it is. When time of testing comes, because you're a Christian, or you've done something right and I persecute you, that's what it is. In time of testing, they fall away. Hmm. It's important. I think you can't quite see it here. Just look at the word receive, joy, and believe. Receive, joy, and believe. They're highlighted there. Thanks, Nick. Appreciate you doing that. Those three words, they give no indication whatsoever that those who are receiving the word of God and believing in it and responding with joy to it are any different from genuine believers. It all looks the same on the outside. I thought there might be a difference and there's not. They receive it the same way real believers do. They believe in it and they receive it with joy. Here's the difference. Here's the necessity of trials. Their response to trials, their response to trials that arise because of the word, I'll talk about that in a minute, that's the only difference between these groups of people. True believers and unbelievers, those who fall away. Matthew 13, I just want to read this to you real quick. Don't have to turn here. Matthew 13, 21. This is how Matthew tells the parable. He says why they fell away. They have no root. He has no root in himself. It's only, he's only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, because of my associating with Christ, because of 
attack of the evil one or his minions, he falls away. If this is going to cost me something, I don't want it. Be done with it. That's what falling away is. And you can't tell the difference until you have the trials. That's, that's a scary thought. I trust your understanding. It's not the trials or our response to them that saves us. Our response to the trials reveals whether the faith by which I am saved is real or not. And this world has a lot of pretenders. You've seen some. You've maybe experienced some in your family. And that's a hard thing to face. I've got a graphic up here. I'll let you go to that graphic here. I wanted to illustrate this. This is just a pictorial representation. My thoughts, it's not authoritative in any sense other than I just wanted to illustrate it. I drew it on the whiteboard and Precious said, oh, that, that's helpful. <laughs> this, is where, this is where it starts. Is I'm over here, I'm walking to the right, and I profess faith. I receive the word, I believe the word, I have joy in the word. And I come to kind of a fork in the road, if you will. It's like the path starts getting spotty. And it gets increasingly dangerous as I go along. There's less, fewer places to stand and more hazards. A lot of people willingly jump off the path and say, this is too difficult. Maybe some of the testimonies we've read this morning. It's too difficult. I don't want to keep up with this. And appropriately, the scripture says they fall away. So I just drew a, a falling away there. You fall into unbelief again, which shows you never really had the faith. You professed it. It appeared to people that you had it. Maybe you were baptized. But that's all the further it went. When trials come because of Christ, because of his righteousness, because of the God he serves and he calls us to serve. Because of doing right, I fall away. I was never there to begin with. Proven faith. Proven faith. Can you think of examples in the Bible? I was thinking of Job. This is King James, which I don't use, but I love the way it translates it. It says, Job said, though he slay me, what is it? Yet I will praise him. Yes, yet. I will praise him, yet I will trust him, though he slays me, though he takes my life. Have you ever thought of that as prophetic for Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ could have said that. In fact, he essentially did by his actions. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I want, but what you want, what you say, what you have planned, Father. I'm willing to trust you. Jesus, as it were, though he never sinned, he had a proven faith. He followed his father all the way down to the grave. Hebrews 11. You don't have to turn here. Just listen to this one. Hebrews 11. We don't have time for this, and I'm running out of time. The, the Hall of Fame of Faith. We all know that. The proven faith group, right? It starts with Abel and goes to Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Moses and all these people. We go, yay, we're cheering. A great cloud of witnesses. It even has the picture of cheering there in the start of the next chapter or the end of the, uh, chapter 11. But we often forget the last part of that chapter where all of a sudden it changes from resurrection and putting foreign armies to flight and it just changes in the middle of a sentence and says, and others were tortured, not accepting their release so that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourgings, even chains and imprisonment. And some were stoned and some were sawn in two. They were tempted and they were put to death with swords and they went about ill-fitting clothing, ill-conceived clothing, destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves. Now look at the house I live in. I said, what does what my faith cost me? Holes in the ground? Here's the epitaph. It says, all of these having gained approval through their faith. They had proven faith. 
They didn't receive what was promised, but embraced it from a distance. But embraced it from a distance. I want to be the ones that, I want to be one of the ones that goes across here. This is not a boast. This is a hope. I hope you'll come with me. This is proven faith when you go through the trials. Here's another example. Philippians 3.10. I love this one. The Apostle Paul. Here's what Paul says about trials. Philippians 3.10. That I may know him and the power of of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his suffering. Jesus suffered, and we get to share the suffering with him. He said, if they hated me, they will hate you. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If you really know me, you're going to have problems, just like I did. That's an evidence of your faith. When you hang on to Christ, ever more so strongly, as you suffer for him that I may know the fellowship of his sufferings, be conformed to his death. And if you go back to Peter, I think 10, 11, and 12 are really talking about the fellowship of his sufferings. It talks about, it talks about the scriptures and, and the prophets as they wrote. It's like, who are we writing about? What person is this about? It's surely not the Messiah, is it? What person? What time? How can this be? I thought the Messiah was going to reign and rule. What person at what time? And it says they recorded as it was revealed to them by the Holy Spirit that these things were written for us, for us upon whom the end of the ages have come so that we could look with faith on the one who suffered and had glories to follow. And Jesus had some of that on earth. He suffered to death and God raised him from the dead in a glorified body. And that was just the beginning. As you see him appear later on, He's scary bright. He's scary glorified. Jesus has been glorified, and now he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he's saying, fellow pilgrims, follow me. Follow me on this hazardous path, this hazardous trial-laden path to prove the faith, the genuineness of the faith that you say you have. 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13, I close with this. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing. Get under it. As though some strange thing were happening to you, but to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. When we walk with Christ in his suffering, not ashamed of him, not ashamed of him, my creator, my savior, my redeemer, my high priest, my soon and coming king, I'm going to have ever more glory with him, in him, when he is revealed and I see him face to face. Then my faith will be sight. It's no longer like this. I no longer see him. It's like... Then I have, I have clear eyes. I won't need glasses, and I'll look him face to face. And like the song that I've, I've referenced before, will I sing for you, Jesus, or, or in awe of you be still? I, I look forward to seeing him. This is a tangible reality, believer. Get ready for the trials. Keep that anchor and get ready to swing down into the trials that surely will come to prove your faith. Would you pray with me?